At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, new customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And what you're about to hear is a three-part conversation that's going to be released throughout this week as we get closer to the NFL season. We have Mark Bortier and Dave DiPaolo. Mark is the host of Yesterday Sports, and Dave has been on Mark's show numerous occasions as old-time buddies because of sports history, basically primarily their love for the Dallas Cowboys. And they both happen to live over on the East Coast. So that's where we're going to have this little crossover event because we're going to air this episode, well, (laughs) not just this one, but all three parts, over on Yesterday Sports as well as the Football History Dude podcast. You'll be able to sit in on this conversation between Mark and Dave, kind of like a fly on a wall. Now, part one talks about Dave's experience heading to Dallas to take part in Super Bowl 45 festivities, and then they're going to get into the main meat and potatoes of the thing, that's Super Bowl 10. So, let's get right into it. Uh, I had a really cool Barry Sanders and a couple other Lions ones, but I know what you mean. I, I let it get bent, so I should have kept it in that stiff uh, holder like you're talking. The only thing is those holders get really yellow. Yeah. And, um, you know, but the, I have, well, I just pulled out a, I, I have a rare one that's, I guess they're only uh, two years that they took a team picture and actually put them in a pennant. And I got them from that guy. He used to come up from the, uh, he used to come up from Texas. He used to come to White Plains, New York for the regional show. It was the only once a year he would come up and he would have a lot of stuff that nobody else would have. And when I went to that Super Bowl down there, he was there. Rick Haskins, that was his name. And I went up to the table. <laughs> and he looked at me, and I looked at him. And, I, and he looked like, I don't know this guy. And I go, do you remember me? And he goes, yeah. I go, where do I know you from? I go, you used to come to the national show in White Plains, New York. And this guy had all kinds of stuff. And he had pennants. He had a lot of pennants. I bought a ton of pennants from him over the year. Yeah, that's a sharp But, but you know. You said you went to the Super Bowl. What you said you like? Were you just like were around for Super Bowl week? When yeah, when Pittsburgh played, um, when Pittsburgh played uh, uh, Green Bay, they had it down in Dallas, and I said, "Let's." Go. I said to my buddies, "Let's go down because I like just going down there." But we didn't go into the stadium. I wasn't going to pay those prices for the. So we went and watched it somewhere. And the fact that the guy that we watched it, he owned a restaurant, and he actually knew Tom Landry's son, which turned out to be kind of a crazy thing. But anyway, um, we we were there for the whole week. It was wonderful. And the, the best thing about it was the weather was lousy, if you oh, remember I, that yeah. Super Bowl. This ice, is where- ice was falling off the roof. Somebody was trying to sue Jerry. It was tremendous. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the uh, people started showing up on Friday. And so Wednesday, Thursday, we had all this. And I, I had talked to a guy who was putting on a thing with Randy White. And I said, well, make sure you tell him I'm coming because he even remember me. And they canceled everything. Everything got canceled that Super Bowl week because of the weather. Emmett Smith was supposed to appear somewhere. Mel Renfro was somewhere. Every And they weren't even putting it out that it was canceled. So... My buddy Al calls up the radio station while we're in the car. And then at the last minute, he gets cold feet. And he hands me his phone. And he goes, here, you you talk. You're used to this. (laughs) So I started talking to the guy. He says, we came down from Connecticut. I said, people are driving off the highway. left, And I'm not even kidding. Left and right, they were driving off the highway. And I said, this is a disgrace. I said, 
you know, the, uh, we would drove up to the casino in Oklahoma, Oklahoma. So that was canceled. Randy White was going to have something there. And believe it or not, the guy that I was talking to who was hosting the show with Randy White, he actually recognized my voice. He called me up. on my. He had my cell phone number. And he goes, was that you I just heard on the radio? And I says, yeah. I says, we, my buddy was calling up, and we wanted to talk about how everything got canceled, and they don't even tell you that it's canceled, and the people are driving off the highway. And, and he, he started laughing, and, and he says, we're not really prepared down here. We don't have any, any salt or sand and everything else. And they really were driving off the highway. We saw at least 15 cars go right into the ravine. Like they were driving like it was completely normal, like it was dry. And so – it was quite a week, but it was, we had a lot of fun. The NFL experience was pretty fun. And, you know, we did all that stuff. We Tom, They had the Tom Landry, his, his wife donated all these personal effects. And it was called the Tom Landry uh, something. And it was at the Cotton Bowl. That's where they had it. And it was indoors at this thing. It's like a big art gallery. And it was the personal collection. That's what it was called. Had his uh, coat on from from this game. Remember the Eagle game, Mark, 1980, the cold game up there in Philly? Yes. NFC Championship. He had that coat with the fur. They, that coat was there. Then he had uh, a couple of other. I think he had the sweatshirt from the ice game. He had that hooded sweatshirt on underneath the coat. Yep. And there was quite a few th- huge pictures of Landry with his kids when they were young. They were made. They were probably 30, probably 48 by 48 maybe three feet wide, four feet high. These massive black and whites, they were crisp. They were tremendous. And that was probably, it was two bucks to get in. How about that? Two bucks. (laughs) It was probably the best thing I did all week. It was absolutely phenomenal. It really was. It was, it was great. Even my buddies, they're not cowboy fans. They, they loved it. They thought it was great. So that was uh, yeah, we went down for that, but, uh, it was we we had we had a lot of fun. There was, we went to the stadium. We did a tour, and nobody was there, so they let us hang around. We were doing all kinds of stuff. <laughs> like the people, it was listen. Not only did it snow, it was bitter. I'm never cold. I like the cold. I like the winter. It was bitter, bitter cold, single digits, and we were kind of not really even dressed for ourselves because we didn't bring a lot of heavy clothing for that. But then by Friday night, Packer fans, Steeler fans started showing up. It's the weather got nice, and on Saturday it was mayhem over in Fort Worth, Texas. That's where they had ESPN was set up and everything else. It was over like in the uh, stockyards area, the old western uh, with the wooden side. It was great. We had a great time. It was good. But that Tom Landry collections thing was absolutely tremendous. Had all his rings, college, and and, and his, his ring from the service, and had a lot of stuff from the service there that you would never see. It was very, very, very interesting. It was good. You would have, Mark, you would have enjoyed it because you like the old stuff. Sounds like it, yeah. Terrific. Yeah, you would have had a blast. <laughs> Sounds like a great, great place. We almost never made it down. We had to go over to, uh, we had to get over to, uh, believe it or not, we had to go to Newark. All the flights got canceled up here in Connecticut. The lady said, we can't get you out until Wednesday. What? <laughs> When's that? We got stuff to do. I said to her, we got to get out of here. My boy, it was six in the morning. I was half, I wasn't even, I had about two hours sleep. I said, we got to get it out. We got to get out of here. I said, let's go. We'll go get a car and we'll drive it down to Newark and we'll leave it there. One of these ones where they don't charge you. If you leave it at another location, I think they charge you now. You can't get away with that. But at the time we were able to do it. We rented a little car, drove it down to Newark from two hours from my front door to the Newark airport, almost on the dot. We got a plane. We actually got an earlier plane. We got there earlier than we wanted to get. But if we waited here at Hartford up at Bradley Airport, we wouldn't have got out for two days. That's what they were. That's what the lady was claiming. We got down to Newark. It was all rain. It wasn't a speck of snow anywhere. Huh. That's how we did it, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to do. You have to do. <laughs> hmm <laughs> No, it was good. Even though we didn't go to the game, it was it was still good. But I did watch Super Bowl ten. I told you during the week I wanted to rewatch yeah. it. And you know, I know you say Pittsburgh was the better team that day. I, I, I know you were saying that 
the Cowboys weren't even supposed to be there, but uh, they gave them. They could have won that game. I'll put it to you that yes, way. Yes, they had. They had. They had them on the ropes. It wasn't. Wasn't until uh, about eight minutes in the fourth quarter. It was about eight and a half minutes left in the game when the Steelers finally took the lead. They had them. Cowboys could have won that game, Mark. You you know you you I I the, there was the only Super Bowl that a team wasn't penalized, and that was Pittsburgh. Yep. They were not penalized. They not one penalty. Yeah, I remember that. I remember the opening. And I I found I found two or three penalties rewatching the game. I know there was there was a clip on Mel Renfro, blatant clip on him on a on a play. There was two terrible calls. We'll get into this if you want to go over it quarter by quarter. But there was two terrible calls in the second quarter. They called these plays dead. There was no whistle. You could hear the audio on that feed is very good. Right. Super Bowl Ten, Pat Summerall and Tom Brookshire. And if you go to the correct link on YouTube, because there's several of them, but if you watch the one that says NFL, 400-something thousand views, I could give you the exact minute to look at those two plays. I'm not crying sour grapes. I don't do that. Right. Um, I really don't. I never did. Those were terrible, terrible calls. There were fumbles. There were blatant fumbles. Right. And they were saying, oh, no. They called <laughs> in. And one of them was recovered by Cliff Harris. I think Dee Dee Lewis picked up the other one. And they were both in the second quarter. But we'll get into it if you want to go ahead, Mark. Well, I, I start, I'd start right from the opening kickoff. You remember, uh, <laughs> they had Preston Pearson and Thomas Henderson back there. They kicked it to Pearson. Pearson gave it to Henderson on a reverse, and off he went. That's and right. And he was on his way for a touchdown. And who tack who? The last guy left to tackle him was the kicker Roy Jarella. And that was just. It I, was. He I was. was and it, he got the bruised <laughs> ribs. I was just debating. There was a Steelers fan I was debating because he was complete. Now, you won four Super Bowls in six years. If you're a Steelers fan, what are you complaining about? He won four Super Bowls in six years. And he's complaining that oh, the score shouldn't have been that close. It wasn't really that close of a game. And he's complaining that Roy Jarella missed four. He told me Roy Jarella missed four field goals. Well, you should rewatch the game because he only missed two field goals. He made two out of four. And like you said, the reason he didn't have – Roy Jarella didn't have a particularly good game is because he bruised his ribs on that tack. And he didn't – like most kickers would just pretend they tripped or they'll m maybe try to dive in front of the guy and trip him up or – but Jarella actually That's right. That's right. put his body out there and tackled him. And if it wasn't for that, that would have been a touchdown. And, uh, yeah, yep. that affected uh, Jarella's kicking for the rest of the game. So he had those bruised ribs. If you go back and look at that play, Randy Hughes misses the – he could have blocked Jarella, you know. He had a shot at getting uh -huh. him. And he missed it. That, that would have went for a touchdown right there if Randy Hughes made that. And I liked Randy Hughes. He was very good for the years. He, I thought he was, very, he was a good tackler. He was good in coverage. But he missed the block. Or he would have went – Henderson was really picking up speed. You didn't see too many linebackers back then, Arnie, running off, running kick kickoffs back. He was – let me say it. Thomas Henderson was a tremendous athlete. And if he wasn't on dope – like I used to say to Summers all the time, you know, he was on dope. And he was. He wrote two books about it. Yeah. You know, one out of control, and then the second one was called In Control. And he came out of Langston College. Um, they called it Langston College. I mean, they didn't, I actually went to it when I was in Oklahoma on Route 66. And it was a tiny little school. And they drafted him. He was the second. They had two first-round picks that year. Randy White was the first pick. They traded for Craig Morton to the Giants. Boy, did they did they bamboozle the Giants on that one. <laughs> Craig Morton was a stiff, okay? And they picked up Randy White, one of the greatest players they ever had in their history, one of the best defensive linemen of all time. I'll put him up against anybody, anyone that ever played. And they pick up and then they pick up Henderson with their second pick, the regular pick in the first round, which was towards the end of the draft. And they took Thomas Henderson. 
The guy was a tremendous talent. They were he was running back kickoffs. <laughs> and start let's start even before that, Mark. Let's start with the worn out carpet. They would never play a Super Bowl today with those kind of crazy the thing's all worn out. Yeah. It's had like the carpet on the field, yeah. you know, was all beat up. Like they would never put that would be beneath them. They go, Oh, we can't have that. They have the pr- has to be pristine. Yeah. Yeah, but the carp and the guy in Summerall even said they're replacing it after the game. It was it was tremendous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other play, uh, which I'm sure you remember, everyone remembers this because a very famous picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated, that amazing catch that Lynn Swan made. That was with I'm just checking my notes here. Two that was with two fifty three left before halftime. Now, what many people don't re- remember about that catch is Pittsburgh. That I think that was that was a fifty-three yard completion. That was a big play and a famous picture. But what a lot of people don't even know is that Pittsburgh didn't even score on that. On that, uh, after he caught that fifty-three yard pass, they got in position for a field goal, and Jarella missed it. So they can't with That's that, right. that famous catch, famous picture on the Sports Illustrated, and they didn't even get a single point from that. And a lot of nope. people don't even. You're right about that. Yep. Of- You're right about that. You know, I made some notes because I, as I watched the game, like as the game seemed to go on, the Cowboys lost a little steam. Do you agree? Like, Well, I think they're – on both offense and especially on offense, yeah. their defense held up. Yeah, but on offense, something was. And Pittsburgh was really putting the heat on them. Well, they they put the heat on them right from the beginning. Uh, they were putting the heat on Starback, and I think that really affected them l- later in the game. Like you said, uh, some people say they got c- too conservative because they had the lead towards the end of the third quarter. Some people say, oh, they got too conservative, but. Every time Staubach went back to pass, he was getting rushed. They were all over him. So the first series, right, they opened up in the first series and he fumbled the ball. Yeah. And L.C. Greenwood came piling in right. on him. And, you know, they had good field position. They should have at least got a field goal out of that series. They wasted that. That nice kickoff return by Anderson was somewhat wasted. Yeah, it was three and out. It went you know? three and out. That was a... Uh, um, and, and there was another, there was another, uh, there was another play in the first quarter where they ran a trap play with Robert Newhouse right. and they popped it open in the middle. They were getting, they were getting a Lambert on the, some of those early trap plays. They were fooling him. Yep. Well, Lambert was very good as much as I don't care for him as a person. He was excellent yep. as a player. He was getting fooled. And if, if, if the Cowboys see, they had Preston Pearson and they had Robert Newhouse. Those were the running backs. Pearson was great out of the backfield. It's like as a third down. They would call him a third down specialist today, Arnie. You know, he caught a lot of – and you know what? He was the only guy on the Cowboy roster that came from another team. Everybody else was homegrown on that team except Preston Pearson. And of all teams he came from, the Steelers, the team that they're playing in the Super Bowl. <laughs> so Preston Pearson was good. and But Newhouse was good too. But he had he didn't have any speed. On that, if you watch that trap play, if that wasn't like Tony Dorsett, he was gone. Yeah. That play was a touchdown. You could see it a mile away. Yeah. But Pierce, but the Newhouse was just wasn't that quick. But they were working with what they had. That's the way it goes. Right. You know what I mean? But they were fooling him in the beginning, and um, you know, by the end of the first quarter, oh, I think it was the second possession in the first quarter. They. Stallback hit Pearson over the middle. And I believe, you could correct me, Mark, you'll know. That was the only touchdown Pittsburgh let up in the first quarter all yep. season. The announcers mentioned that. Yep. The whole they made it look easy, the Cowboys. Yeah. Somebody cleared over the middle. Pearson ran through. And Stallback hit him on a nice and just ran, he just ran in for the touchdown. It was the only points, a touchdown. That's right. Not points, touchdown that Pittsburgh allowed in the first quarter for the entire yep. season. And the Cowboys made it yeah, look easy. They did. And they held the lead. Because you t- 
I wanted to look it up, Mark, before, but do you know, b- before they got to the Super Bowl, they played Minnesota in the Hail Mary game, and then they took the Rams apart out there in Los Angeles. What I don't even want the point spreads in those games. I, I, I wanted to look it up. I didn't look it up with the point spreads in those. I know they were underdogs. The Cowboys were big underdogs against the Rams. Oh, I know that, that is a tremendous Rams team. And they didn't – oh, they just completely dominated the Rams that day. That. that was one of the best games I ever saw the Cowboys play. That came against the Rams. <laughs> they just tore them apart. And it was in Los Angeles at the uh, Coliseum. And they were heavily – like you said, the Rams were heavily favored. They had a great season. They mauled the, the Cardinals in their uh, – the divisional playoff game. The Rams mauled the Cardinals. And Dallas just took them apart. Like they were the Rams so they, were never in they, the game. That was another. They, they, uh, uh, was that Pat Hayden? Uh, quarterback for the Rams? I think it was. I think Jaworski played in that game too. Jaworski. Oh, they did had he? James, I don't know if Hayden played in that game. They had James Harris. I think James Harris started. And then I got to, I got to rewatch, I got to rewatch that game. But I, I know I'm this, sure. what, what the deal was, Arnie, was the, the Cowboys brushed. I know that the 49ers used the shotgun in the fifties, but it hadn't been used since. So it was 20 years in the past since anybody had seen this shotgun, Arnie, come, you know, formation. And all of a sudden Landry dusted it off to give Staubach a little extra time. And they used it all season long, and they ran a couple of plays, like a shovel pass. They were very – it was – I think – didn't Landry get coach of the year that year, Mark? Yeah, I think it was the only time. 19th, I think that was the only time he ever got coach of the year. He, he, he really got innovative that season. And so these things that we saw in the playoffs, the Rams were very confused. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Cowboys – I would, was that 36-6? 37-7, to to yeah. 37 Thirty-seven to seven. Jaworski took over. just t- took him apart. Jaworski took over at quarterback. They started James Harris, and Harris threw a couple interceptions. And they put Jaworski in, but they just they just mauled him. They tore him apart in that game. Now the other, the, yeah, it was a great right? game. And when they got to the Super Bowl, you know Pittsburgh. I I, I didn't look it up, but they were. They were probably favored by at least a touchdown, don't you think? Something probably like that. At least, yeah, at least. And uh, I'm surprised there wasn't more, really. But Landry always said that was his most enjoyable season of coaching because he he really no he he used he used to talk about that. You're right. He mentioned it several times. Um, I was I'm just looking. I remember as the second quarter started, Bradshaw took off on a run. Right. And you could really see how fast this guy was. People sell this. Let me tell you, when you talk about some of the best quarterbacks of all time, people always leave him off the list. You don't really hear Bradshaw get mentioned. And then I, he's kind of got he got a little crazy this year with some of the stuff he was talking about. He got a little, like, politically correct with the stuff in the studio with some of the stuff. I don't really agree with some of that stuff, his views, but – as a player, he was very, very tough. He took off on a play, and Brookshire said he had 4.5 speed, which is hard to believe. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if they were exaggerating with some of these things that they're talking about, but he was very, very fast, Bradshaw, a lot faster than you would think. Yeah, yeah, he ran a lot early in his career. He ran a lot, and he struggled. And he was very tough. He could oh, take a yeah. hit. You know what I mean? He took some brutal, brutal hits like on Bradshaw. Out of that game. And he took one in this game. He got knocked out of that game at, at uh, the end of the fourth quarter. On that pass that he threw yep. to, to Swan. Larry Cole. Larry yep. Cole. It, it, it went into halftime. It was 10 to 7 with the Cowboys leading. Right. And. Um, those two plays I'm going to tell you about in the second quarter. One was a path to John Stallworth, okay? And as he was coming down with the ball, it came out of his hands. Like the ball, the, he hadn't even hit the ground right. yet. His, his, um, his, 
knees or nothing had hit the ground. The ball came out, and somebody picked it up for the Cowboys, and they they said, oh, the play is over. And Summerall and Madden just like kind of went along with it. That's Today that would get questioned. Right. That would get questioned to, to no end today because you know how they are with this and this. But back then they just said, oh, the, this and this and the play. What a, what a play by Storth. But no, the ball came out and the Cowboys – had picked it up, and and then that was that's it. If you go to that exact game that I'm telling you about, where it says NFL Super Bowl ten, I think it shows the Lynn Swan catch and the little right. thumbnail, and it says um, it says four um four hundred and something thousand views. If you go to thirty five minutes, right. right at the thirty five minute mark, you'll see that play, and then if you go to the fifty six minute mark you'll see the next one i'm talking about and that's what larry brown the tight end the larry brown he comes he comes down with the ball and as he's coming down with it somebody punches it out the ball comes out and cliff harris i think or or dd lewis one of them jumps on the ball and it, it was they were they would have had the ball and it was well, i think on the 45 yard line and i'm thinking to myself how are they how are they saying that these plays are over? How could they be over? The guy didn't even hit the ground <laughs> yet. He's not even on the ground. He's still standing yeah. up. I'll have to rewatch that. I'll have to. Re-watch. I'm telling you, it's a history. Pittsburgh used to get a lot of calls. It goes back to that Super Bowl against even against the Seahawks. That was one of the worst. That was the worst officiated Super Bowl of all time. Pittsburgh. Against Seattle, they got a lot of breaks in that game, Pittsburgh, a lot. They really did. And they got a couple of big ones in this game. If if you go and watch those plays. I'm telling you, anybody that listens to this, there's anybody listening, you go back and type in the type in the darn times that I told you. 35 minutes in, 56 minutes in. You will see those two plays. You will be wondering, what the heck are these yeah. plays? What are they? <laughs> I mean, Pittsburgh didn't get any point. Pittsburgh didn't get any points out of either right. of them. They didn't get any points. But the bottom line is, the Cowboys. These plays were happening where if they got some more yardage, they could have got points. Right. You know right. what I'm right. saying? So I don't know. Um, those were two big. Those were two big things. You know, on the next possession. Uh, there was somebody got oh Staubach got sacked twice. The Cowboys were in good field goal range, Mark. This was right before the half, I believe. And um, in the next possession, they got sacked twice. They, P- Pittsburgh knocked them all the way back to the forty-five yard yeah, line. I remember. They would have had. It would have been. Uh, it would have been thirteen to seven yep. at the half yep. instead. They were moving the ball pretty good. They really were, and they just. They didn't get on the board there, yeah, you know. I remember that. Now you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, Cliff Harris, so I wanted to bring up. Uh, this was probably uh, this was about uh, five minutes into the third quarter, and the Cowboys were ahead ten to seven. Now uh, Pittsburgh got into field goal range, uh, and Jarella missed another field goal. Now we have the most. I know we have the most overblown <laughs> incident. This this is talked about. Well, the Steeler fans go crazy over this, and it was so overblown. It was the Jarella missed the field goal. Cliff Harris went over to the kicker Roy Jarella, patted him on the helmet. We don't. I don't know if he ever, you know. Revealed what he said to him. It could, you know, he probably just said, you know, thanks for helping us out by missing the kick. He patted him on the helmet. Now Lambert sees this, and I don't blame him for, you know, defending his teammate. He grabs Cliff Harris, throws him to the ground. Then uh, Jethro Pugh from the Cowboys, defensive tackle, comes, escorts Cliff Harris off the field. The referee escorts Lambert off the field. So, that nothing escalates. That's what they're supposed to do. They break it up. They get him off the field, and they go back to the game. So, but now, years later, Lambert tells tells all the Steeler fans that he was responsible for 
firing up, you know, our team wasn't playing that well. And because of that incident, I fired up my teammates and then we started playing well, which is a bunch of baloney because uh, they were still winning. You, 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 it was, they were still winning. You know those. It's just. Do you remember, Mark, those Super Bowl highlight uh, that they do at the end of the year yeah. where they would. Uh, John Facenda narrated him. He brings it up on this highlight thing. And he says, he, he yeah. same thing. He talks about Harris, he, this, this. If that ever happened today, let me tell you what would happen. They wouldn't have saw Cliff, Cliff Harris pat the kicker on the head. First of all, that's not even really anything. They would have missed it, which they did, kind of did. Everybody saw Lambert throw Cliff, Cliff Harris to the ground. He flung him right down to the ground. That would have been a penalty right. today. This, it's always the, the second guy that gets caught. Yep. And that, that was not a penalty. No, no penalty there. And I'm thinking to myself, Steve, it was pretty blatant. It was right after, you know, everything happened. It was the Cliff Harris pad on the helmet was yeah. really nothing. Like, you, if you weren't looking for that, you might not have seen it. But you saw, what's his name, grab him by the shoulder pads and fling him right. to the ground. No penalty. Yeah. You know what well, I mean? That, that wasn't really what, what – I mean, it, it, that really wasn't what bothered me so much. It was that this this uh, myth, you might call it, that – that Lambert, you know, the whole uh, the whole uh, outcome of the game was decided there, you know. Like the whole game changed at that moment, which is a bunch of baloney because the Cowboys were still leading 10-7. to 7, And what really changed that game was that blocked punt. What was that? The beginning of the fourth quarter, I think, right? What was that? It was. What it was, was his name? The uh, Mitch the Hops. Steel, yeah, that was the Cowboys punter. Uh, I can't remember the name of the the player who blocked the punt. Was it Glenn Edwards? I don't think so. I think it was a special teams player. That was nine minutes. Nine minutes left in the game when they blocked that punt. Right at the beginning, the beginning of the fourth quarter. And they got a safety off of that. They recovered it. Uh, well, Dallas recovered it, but there, there was a uh, safety. And so that made it 10 to 9. And from there, that's really what changed the, uh, the whole tempo of the game. Yes. I couldn't agree with you more. But then, um, what happened, Arnie? You know what? This was Super Bowl ten. And so up until that point, you know, Arnie, the consensus of Super Bowls were that they were boring. This is what was going on. They were all boring. That's what people would say. The only really close one, I guess, if you want to say, was Super Bowl V, where the Cowboys lost in the closing seconds, but there was eight or nine turnovers in that game. But it was still a very entertaining game. 16-13, it was a very close game. But all the other Super Bowls were not that competitive. So when Pittsburgh played Dallas this first time, even though Dallas was the first wild card team to go to a Super Bowl, they were saying Dallas doesn't understand a chance because Pittsburgh was the reigning Super Bowl champs. They won Super Bowl nine, And so that's the setup for Super Bowl ten, really, you know, if you, if you look at it in that way. And, and they were very good, Pittsburgh, but – the Cowboys had a lot going for them. They, they they had a lot of momentum. They beat. They were coming off that big win against the Rams. They went into Super Bowl ten. They weren't really intimidated, and that's the line that they used in that uh, highlight clip. Sporting to Jack Lambert said, "We're supposed to be the intimidators." Remember yes. that, Mark? He said, "We." That's what he said. Dallas was kind of intimidated, and we're supposed to be the intimidators. He said. So according to Lambert, that's what he think he claims he claimed he stated well, the that. defense was already uh, Pittsburgh's defense was already playing tremendously. So I don't know how he figures, you know, that that incident, that stupid little incident where he threw Cliff Harris to the game, <laughs> changed the whole tempo of the game, and all of a sudden our defense started playing well when they had already been playing well the entire game. Both defense uh, uh, yeah, well, 
you you said it was ten to nine, and the Cowboys had a free kick. After you get a safety, you got to kick the ball. So the Cowboys punted the ball away, and the Steelers returned it to the Cowboys forty five right. yard line, and the Cowboys held them to a field That's goal. That's right. So it was still they just took the lead. It was twelve to ten Pittsburgh. Yep. But that that was a great defensive stand by the Cowboys. Yes. Um. By holding Pittsburgh to a field goal, but even more impressive was the next series when when the Cowboys, excuse me, couldn't Pittsburgh got the, the Cowboys got the ball back. I think it was Glenn Edwards that stepped in front of Staubach and he returned it to like the Cowboys ten yard line, and once again the Cowboys held him to a field right. goal. Arnie, it was very. I'm telling you, the Cowboys defense was getting very tenacious, yeah. very tenacious. Oh, it was a tremendous defensive game. Both both defenses played tremendously, and there was some really hard hitting. The hitting was vicious, and like like you say, uh, right? They held them two times. Two times they held them to a field goal, fifteen to ten. By the by today's standards, Bernie, pe- people would call this game boring. <laughs> okay, but. Back then, like defensive battles were very appreciated. I think, and this was a there was not a ton of scoring, but there was enough stuff going back and forth. You know, to have the ball like that on the side of, the, and then again at the ten yard line, the Cowboys' defense really cracked down. They were trying to run the ball. Uh, did they throw a pass on that series, Mark? Do you remember, or was that? I think they threw one pass out of the three think, downs. Yeah, and I think they threw one. I can't remember. But I'll tell you another another uh, big play. That was the first. It was actually the first play of the fourth quarter. There you go, part one of Super Bowl Ten with Mark and Dave. Now tune in tomorrow to hear about that crazy first play of the fourth quarter they were talking about. And what's the best way to do that? You ask. Well, gotta make sure you mash that little subscribe or follow button on your podcast player choice. That way you'll be notified as soon as the episode releases. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. I put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand, and that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Ah, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great. On the next kickoff, who would end up as returner? But Harry Wilson. Wilson dodged at least a half. Recall the greatest moments in sports history, or just your own personal favorites, with Row One Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com/slash row one. That's R O W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like T-shirts, long sleeve shirts. Telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan.
when the gun Sports shouted to mark the Penn State 14 0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.